and welcome everyone to the Nikhil Hogan Show. I'm very thrilled to speak to my guest today, guitarist and lutist Nicola Pignatiello. He teaches at the Liceo Giordano Bruno in Rome and also at CESMI. This is the episode that all my guitarist audience members have been waiting for and we will be deep diving into Parimento on the guitar. Nicola has recorded some really beautiful Partimento realizations on the guitar that have received very positive responses from the Partimento community, and we will further talk about Partimento on the guitar. Nicola, welcome to the Nikhil Hogan Show. Hi, Nikhil, and thank you for uh, inviting me. Can I ask you a little bit about your background first? When did you start music, and when did you start the guitar? Yeah, I, I started music with... When I was a little kid in, uh, in my village, I, I came from a really tiny village in the uh, south of Italy, Lacedonia. It's about 2,000 people. And uh, uh, in uh, Lacedonia, there is uh, a lot of music, uh, like, I don't know the English, we say, like, band. It's like wind orchestras okay. playing uh, in uh, mass, uh, funeral, uh, and, and religious parties. Okay. Uh, I started with the trumpet. And then after uh, two, three years, I, I found a guitar teacher because I liked it much more the guitar. So I started to, um, to play the guitar like at 10 years old in, uh, yeah, in, like privately in, uh, in my village. And then I started the conservatorium when I was uh, 15. Were you learning classical guitar from the beginning? No, I grew up with a mixed program, let's say, with the classical. I remember the, uh, some, some studies uh, of Giuliani, Carulli like the 120 arpeggios of Giuliani on classical guitar, but also a lot of blues and rock music. Oh, so you were exposed to Giuliani from a very young age then? Yes. Okay. Yes, it was one of the first things I played on the guitar. <laughs> and so tell me, what happened at the conservatory when you started at 15? Were you doing a pretty traditional classical guitar education? So it means typically a lot of repertoire and that sort of thing? Yes, in the conservatorium, I, I had a totally classical uh, guitar program and I was really into it. So I, I was studying a lot of uh, repertoire and uh, also a lot of uh, technique, of course, in different styles, uh, from Bach to contemporary music, passing through romantic and uh, classical uh, age. And, uh, well, I, I remember I just stopped it to to play solos, uh, and I became a, a really good uh, sight reader, uh, reading uh, music of other people, but not anymore making solos like I was uh, used to in uh, blues and rock. So you used to improvise blues and rock before? Yes, yes. I, that's that's mainly what I, what I did when I, I was playing also the electric guitar. That's very interesting because you have both the contemporary side and the classical side at the same time. Can I just ask in Italy, because in Singapore, when they take classical guitar lessons, it's mainly for a music exam, and then they play repertoire, and then they do the test, and then that's it. And there's really no improvisation, there's no composition. But what was it like in your village? Was it like that, or was there a bit more variety? Were people who were taking guitar lessons there also learning different styles? Uh, in my village, uh, you know, when, when you have a little village, you just have like one or two teachers. So all the program is about uh, what are uh, the um, what is the, the musical taste of this teacher, and this uh, in particular that was my teacher. Also his name is uh, Nicola. He was really into blues and rock and also some bossa nova. So we used to to let's say make a lot of chamber music, but not chamber music like in the classical uh, in a classical point of view, but uh, like playing together as a as a band. And so were you doing 10 years of conservatory training? Yeah, the program was uh, the old program of 10 years, but I was so into it that I finished like in, in seven. Wow, impressive. And I, was, I was spending all, all my time uh, studying and studying and practicing. <laughs> and so what was your direction? Did you see yourself as a concert guitar player? Yeah, totally. Yeah. In fact, uh, after uh, graduating in uh, in Italy, I wanted to, to go on... Um, in, uh, in Maastricht in Holland, where I found uh, Carlo Marchione, that is one of the best guitarists I ever met. And he's also a very good teacher. And um, the point of the master was just to, to become a concert player. And that's what, uh, what I did uh, many, not, not so many years, let's say, <laughs> not that old. <laughs> let's say in the last uh, 10 years, I played uh, many concerts as a classical guitar player. Now, when did you discover Parlamento and when did that 
start to be something that you were interested in? I heard the first time the word Partimento in a private class with Enrico Baiano. The, um, the Conservatorium of Maastricht had a nice, nice program that for the master students, they just paid some private class. You could choose any teacher out of the school and they will pay the private class. So uh, with my friend Daniele, that we were playing in Duo Scarlatti, a lot of Scarlatti, uh, we were in love with the recordings of Enrico Baiano. So we took a flight to Naples and went to have a lesson with uh, Baiano. That is a, an incredible player and an incredible teacher at the same time. What made you decide to take, because he's a harpsichordist, right? So you're a guitarist. Why did you decide to take lessons from a harpsichordist? Uh, because we were working a lot on uh, Scarlatti and uh, Bach, so a lot of harpsichord uh, repertoire. And we, we wanted to have lessons with somebody who really spent uh, most of his uh, life playing uh, that, uh, that repertoire. Because, you know, on the guitar you, you play maybe too much repertoire. You, you never focused for uh, so much like a cembalo player on Scarlatti on Bach. You can do for a few years, but not for 30 years. And we were really in love with uh, Baiano made some incredible recordings of uh, Scarlatti sonatas. And we wanted uh, to, to listen his point of view on that music. Just really quickly, uh, is there any particular recording you can recommend that you really, that were really nice? Any particular pieces? Uh, he recorded a full CD of, uh, of Scarlatti sonatas. So I, we found first on YouTube because the, the CD was uh, sold out uh, and we couldn't find anywhere the CD. So somebody put this uh, CD on YouTube. And also Baiano told us that he, he was happy about this because uh, so some people can hear the, the music. I cannot uh, remember the, the label, but I, I, I can find. So tell me about those lessons. What happened at the lessons? Well, during the lesson, I remember we were playing mostly um, Concerto Italiano by Bach. That as a, the, the second tempo of the concerto is an andante with a, an accompaniment and a kind of uh, improvisation in the melody, but it's all written out by Bach. And I remember Baiano told us that at the time they were used to, um, to improvise ornaments, but also was, uh, there was a full um, academic program about uh, improvisation that was called uh, Partimento. And, uh, well, he told us this, uh, this word uh, and it's ticked into my mind for, uh, for uh, <laughs> quite a long time. Well, what year, by the way, what year was this when you discovered Partimento? It was like uh, 2005 or wow. 12, maybe 2006. Okay, wow. That's a full, that's a long time ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if the, the book of Sanguinetti was already out in the that, year. I believe that was published in 2012. Ah, okay. So, yeah, before that book. Because, of, of course, um, also Professor Sanguinetti spent a lot of time uh, studying and talking about this in a conference, writing articles. So, in that year, so. Uh, all the, the topic of Partimento was known just by a few people. I, I, I heard that word for the first time from Baiano, and I remember that when I was speaking with other colleagues about this topic, uh, nobody knew what we were talking about. And that's in Italy, so really, right? That's, that's right. Yeah. That's, yes. <laughs> yes. That's astonishing. Okay, so how did that continue to grow then? Because as I think historically, Partimento is a keyboard activity, what made you think about Partimento on the guitar? When I, I told you I was playing blues and rock when I was a, a teenager, I remember that when I was like jamming with other colleagues in the conservatorium, I was pretty good in improvising like on the pentatonic scale. I could improvise a solo in the blues. And I felt really better that I could not improvise anything in classical style. And I always felt this like... A, like a, like a shame, I can say, yes. When I heard the Partimento from uh, Enrico Baiano, and then uh, I started looking from, uh, for some articles, then finally I got the, the book of Sanguinetti, I found that there was a program, there was a way to learn how to improvise also in a classical, uh, a classical style that was not just a legend, that you don't need to be <laughs> a genius to do it. 
You know, it, when I was in the conservatory, somebody told me the story that Bach could uh, improvise a fugue, and for mo- for me was, you know, the only the only response to to this legend was, of course, Bach can do it, but you have, you have a normal human being cannot do this thing. Then a few years ago, um, uh, there was a, a conference about improvisation appartimenti in Tor Vergata that was organized uh, by Sanguinetti. And there was uh, an incredible organ and chamber player there holding this lesson. And he just improvised a fugue in front of all of us. It was a partimento fugue. And I was really shocked. <laughs> I, I say, oh, wow. So that... <laughs> You, you don't have to be back to do, to do these kind of things. So 2005 to 2012, were you starting to look for articles and try to find your own way on the guitar with Partimento? Uh, I was trying to, to find a way to improvise in Baroque music because uh, Carlo Marchione, that was the guitar teacher in Maastricht, uh, he, he, he worked a lot on uh, Baroque music. So for two years, we were playing mostly Baroque music. And I was really into this um, topic of uh, improvisation and ornamentation. And so my, uh, in fact, my final thesis was uh, improvising on Bach. I made some improvisation on the Italian concerto after reading, uh, you know, like original sources and articles and listen to recordings, uh, trying to figure out how to, how to do it on the, on the guitar. And uh, yes, that that was mostly about uh, Baroque music. Then uh, after when I became a teacher, I wanted to um, I wanted to try on the students uh, some uh, some lessons about improvisations, and um, I found that uh, it was super fun for me and also for the students uh, and uh, super interesting uh, about uh, pedagogy. I felt that was something really, really good to do. And also that uh, I needed uh, as a teacher and as a musician to to promote this kind of program. Because, you know, uh, we are now in 2021 and we play mostly classical music. So in the in the life of a guitar player, there is a lot of music that is very far from us in the in the time. When you propose this kind of music to kids that normally can can listen to hip hop, rock, uh, and they have uh, Instagram, Facebook, they they live in a totally different world from Giuliani and Carulli. They feel this music like being really, really old, like <laughs> out of their out of yeah, their Yeah, when life. people say old, they think like two years ago, but we're talking really old. We're talking a couple hundred years ago. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, I feel that they can, the students can feel this music out of their uh, reality. So uh, it's like, I don't know, your grandpa telling stories of the war. I say, oh, come on. <laughs> so um, uh, I felt that uh, when they start to learn some little things about improvisation, they can start writing uh, some uh, little pieces. Um, this uh, gap, this time gap just disappear they start to think this music just like music. Okay, so I want to ask you a little bit about the history of of the guitar and partimento. When did the guitar, the six-string classical guitar, was that around in the 18th century, in the 17th century? Were people playing six-string guitars at that time? The guitar had six string uh, like at the end of the uh, 18th century. Uh, the problem with the guitar is that is a is an instrument that changed a lot during time. You know, the first guitar was like a Renaissance uh, four-string guitar. Then we had the the five-string uh, with but with double courses uh, like a lute uh, that we usually call a baroque guitar. Then we have some intermediate uh, instruments uh, uh, like uh, we had um, a six-string guitar but with double courses. And then finally, we arrived uh, like at the end of uh, 18th century to a six-string guitar with single courses. Sorry, Nicola, what's a course? What, what do you mean by that? String. Oh, I see. Okay, so, but you said double courses. What does double courses mean? Uh, d- double strings, uh, like um, cori. So there's two strings per... 
Yes, that's sometimes are uh, at the same tone. Right. Sometimes they are at octave. So, like for contemporary music, that's like a twelve-string guitar. Uh, yes, kind I'd of. Say, yeah, a kind of. Okay, and wow, that's pretty late then. At the end of the eighteenth century, and and what what do you mean, like seventeen eighty, seventeen ninety, something like that? I think it should be about uh, seventeen. No, seventeen fifty or sixty. Like to have the first uh, the first guitars, uh, we found also some. Uh, you know, they used to to have an old guitar that was a baroque guitar, and they brought to a luthier to 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 change the shape of the guitar and to have six strings instead of five. And we have the same with lutes too. So we have some instruments that uh, were originally in one shape, and then they were modified in another shape. So when we talk about the classical guitar, there are a few names that come up. And I think one of the most famous ones is Fernando Sor, and he was born 1778, and Mauro Giuliani, 1781, Fernando Carulli. Would you consider them, their style, kind of the 18th century Italian Neapolitan tradition? The guitar, let's say, is not the center of the history of music in in this time, and like uh, all the side projects, let's say, it, it was not really on time with history of music. So the the style of Sor Giuliani Carulli is not the same as we could say like Beethoven. That was a uh, Beethoven was born exactly the same year of Carulli. So the the guitar was a bit a bit uh, late in style in front of the piano, violin, or uh, orchestra. Also because, uh, because a matter of, um, of the develop- development of instruments. Because the guitar changed a lot. So, for example, a piano player came from a big tradition of forte piano and cembalo and organ players, where they mostly have the same, uh, or, or let's say a very, very similar technique. But uh, on the guitar, you, you don't have this kind of thing because the guitar was totally different uh, 100 years before. So they didn't have a real tradition of, uh, of playing that instrument because the instrument was so different. When we talk about the Baroque, people did play these. They're not so similar to the guitar. The, for instance, the lute, the thurbo. Is there anything that's similar when you play the lute and then you play the guitar? Because I know you also play the lute. They they didn't used to play so many instruments like us. Today, an uh, early plucked music uh, player normally plays like uh, five, six instruments. You play Baroque guitar, Renaissance guitar, uh, Renaissance lute, Tiorbo, uh, Viola. They, they were not used to so many instruments. Normally, they were playing uh, like lute and Tiorbo or lute and Baroque guitar. But Baroque guitar is very, very different uh, um, in making music from uh, the classical guitar. So it's, we, we say guitar, but it's a, a very different instrument. And we can say the maybe the lute is more similar to the guitar than the baroque guitar to the to what we call the classical guitar today. Because um, the baroque guitar didn't have the basses. And that's very important to know, because if we think about uh, how they were playing music, they didn't have not even the sixth string, uh, but also the fifth string, what we have today, the low A, was uh, was normally with the octave higher. So it was just like the A on the second fret of the third string. Oh, that's weird. So, so okay, so like basically, when you go, you expect lower strings, it actually goes higher then. Yes, that's why it's it like was, a ukulele. Uh, <laughs> a kind of. <laughs> uh, I'm more refined ukulele, but uh, it didn't allow you to have basses, uh, so it was not a, a good instrument to play la like condolute that way, when you have a bass that accompany a melody up. But with the baroque guitar, it's all uh, strumming and uh, arpeggios. It's much more a melodic instrument than uh, a polyphonic one. Were people realizing basso continuo on these instruments like the baroque guitar and the lute were they looking at at figures and were they realizing st- strumming uh in the yes, early yes, totally. 17th and i mean in the 17th and the 18th century yes totally uh, and we have also methods for uh, realizing basso continuo on the lute on the turbo and also on the baroque guitar there was uh, nicola mattei 
that wrote also a book about was famous because his, uh, his way to realize basso continuo on the guitar was comparable to a cembalo player. He was very famous for this. Uh, we can remember that uh, François Campion, that was a turbo player, a lute player, he, he claimed to be the inventor of the rule of the octave. He was, playing, he was playing in the orchestra in the Opera of Paris, and he said that, that uh, he had this rule that his teacher told him to accompany in every situation uh, with, uh, with guitar or lute or whatever. So yes, uh, totally they were uh, realizing uh, basso continuo. Why did you pick as models Giuliani and Carulli? What sets them apart from the other, I guess, guitarists of that era? Because they were Napolitan. Carulli from, was from Naples. Uh, Giuliani not, but he studied with a Napolitan teacher. And uh, so they were grown up in this uh, Neapolitan, uh, let's say, um, music world. And when I started to, um, to look for guitar and partimenti, I remember for a couple of years, I was really frustrated because I couldn't find any, any proof that uh, guitar was uh, realizing partimenti. I couldn't find any book about guitar and partimenti. Uh, not even one line of a manuscript uh, for guitar and partimenti. So I, I was really frustrated, and uh, at some point I had an idea. I decided uh, if you, if I cannot find any proof that somebody was realizing partimenti on the guitar, I can assume that uh, if you were born in Naples and you were studying music, this was the common musical language. So let's say. Uh, you could uh, also not study partimenti like a cembalo player, like uh, you could not uh, play fenaroli durante and make all the exercises. But anyway, you were into this musical world. So I wanted to find uh, if there were traces of this kind of style in their music. And uh, in this way, I found many, many, many traces of this style in their music. And so I, yeah suddenly my frustration went uh, away. If we talk about the Neapolitan method, there's three years of singing solfeggi. I think they wrote solfeggi, right? And they sold solfeggi. Is that right? Ferdinando Carulli, uh, when he moved to Paris, he had uh, most of his musical life in Paris. Uh, he published many, many, many books uh, of guitar and also one of solfeggi with accompaniment of guitar. If we could talk a little bit about Giuliani himself, what is interesting about his style that you saw that was, because you said you were looking, right, for traces. So what did you find in Giuliani? Uh, yeah, uh, first I want to say that Giuliani, he was in living in Puglia, in uh, Bisceglie, is uh, one of the southern parts of Italy, and suddenly came uh, a cello player from Naples, Gaetano Lucci, that married the sister of uh, Giuliani Mauro, and he also had the brother, Nicola Giuliani. And uh, um, uh, we know that uh, this cello player uh, taught music uh, to Giuliani and the brother. I was looking everywhere uh, about uh, the life of this cello player, but I couldn't find uh, any, any new about him. Uh, but we know that uh, also the cello players in Naples were studying uh, and realizing uh, partimenti and numbers on the bass. This we know from um, a student of uh, Rotterdam uh, Hoke School uh, wrote a beautiful thesis about uh, the cello in Naples in that year, so we know that we're, they were studying these kind of things. And uh, um, Giuliani moved uh, first in Trieste, then uh, to Vienna, where he had, the, the, um, let's say, the, the most of his uh, musical career. And uh, he published a lot of studies for, uh, for guitar students because uh, guitar was uh, in a really good, good uh, moment. So uh, we know that from the publisher, Giuliani made more money selling the 120 arpeggios for guitar than Beethoven for some of his sonatas. Really? That's ridiculous. <laughs> yes, but it, it's the market, you know. That's incredible. So you're saying he outsold Beethoven. Yes. <laughs> Yes, totally. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it, it's the market. <laughs> so he wrote, uh, he wrote, he published a lot for uh, students. And uh, what I found in, but also a lot of concert uh, music, he wrote the first uh, concerto for guitar orchestra. He, 
yeah, you really did uh, a lot of incredible stuff. And uh, what I found uh, is that in, uh, in Giuliani, we have a lot of studies uh, that just look like uh, counterpoint exercises. Uh, they're really close to the, if you know, the Lavinia, um, the Lavinia manuscript. There are mostly two voices, uh, a lot, many times on a base that is just a scale. And, uh, you know, I, I have something here because uh, I found that, especially in Opus uh, 51 and Opus 50, I can play something on the guitar. Okay. They have, uh, like, Opus, Opus 51 is just two voice counterpoint. Uh, Number two, as the bass, this is just a scale. Do, re, mi, fa, mi, re. And then, sol, la, si, do, re, re, with compound cadence. And most of the studies are, are made in this style. And I think is a, it cannot be just a case. It's really the same language we find on the counterpoint. Uh, and the counterpoint manuscript. Uh, so I, I found this in Giuliani, but also many, many Galant schemata. They they have a lot. I found that Giuliani really liked the the Mayer. He used a lot the Mayer, but also the Doremi, and many many printers. Uh, this is a a sonatina from the Opus uh, 71. So. That starts with do re mi, so it's really their uh, their musical language uh, is this one. Does counterpoint flow easily on the guitar? So is it a struggle to find these notes? Because on the keyboard it's quite straightforward, right? But on the guitar, does it feel natural or does it feel like a really a, a finger twister? Uh, no, this kind of music is really natural on the guitar because it was written by a, a great guitarist. But when you try to make your own uh, exercise in counterpoint the guitar, yeah, you, you can get crazy. So you're actually saying it does flow quite nicely then on the guitar. Yeah, yeah but I, you know, I have a kind of uh, example. If you have something like uh, the bass that goes up by, by step, you, you normally use the 5-6-5-6, five, six, five, six, no? So a, a, normally, a normal realization would be... Etc. In this year of pandemic, I studied a lot because I really had nothing to do with, <laughs> with right. concerts. They were all cancelled. So I, I was uh, studying the, um, the Lavinia manuscript. And there are some uh, realizations of this, of this movement, of this typical movement. Uh, if we compare the Lavinia solutions, uh, are really much more difficult on the guitar and much less effective than the Giuliani one. For example, in Lavinia, we have... Uh, well, in Giuliani, we have something that is much more guitaristic. It sounds much better on the guitar and it's much easier to play because it's like also a kind of schema for the fingers on the fretboard. So when you mean guitaristic, like for instance, the rule of the octave on the keyboard, no problem, right? Just whatever you want, just change the key, the fingers move a little bit. But on the guitar, not so straightforward. Do you find the rule of the octave is, I mean, you can't, do you have to compensate sometimes when you're doing something like the rule of the octave? Yes, you have to compensate uh, the number of voices, but also the octave of the bass. There is something very nice that uh, I, I made a research about the rule of the octave on the guitar. And I found that uh, when the guitar had only uh, five uh, strings, they, they made the, the bass just going up, like uh, do, re, mi, fa, so, do, si, do. So this is uh, Doisy, that was a French guitar player that wrote this rule on the octave on this method. A six, a six, and it's full of octaves because you cannot avoid this on the five chord guitar. But when the guitar got the six string, Ferdinando Carulli also wrote his rule of the octave. We have the bass that goes do, re, mi, and then one octave down. 
also they they were really used to compensate because on the guitar is the only way you you can do it. Okay, so what you're saying is you it's not always going to be straightforward up and down. Sometimes you might have to jump, right? Uh, an octave. Yeah, not normally you have to jump. Ah, okay, very interesting. If somebody wants to attempt partimento on the guitar, let's start at the beginning. Now, I've read that you've you've mentioned that we have to adapt from the keyboard because obviously the partimento was designed for the keyboard. How should somebody start if they have a guitar and what should they do first? I think a, a really good way to start is uh, Fenaroli, also for the guitarist, because he's uh, super, um, let's say, didactical. He's so well structured as a number of lessons. But it's important to do jo- don't just read the Fenaroli and try to, to realize but first, uh, look in the example like you ha- that you have in Guitar Repertoire. For example, if you want to try Fenaroli book first, that you can just put charts uh, on the on the bass, uh, and, and you have also numbers, uh, a good way to start uh, is to look at the rule of the octave of uh, Carulli, also Molino wrote the rule of the octave, Ledoui, Caspar Merz. We have many examples of rule of the octave on the guitar, with typical positions for the guitar. Are all of them similar or are they all a little different? No, they are very similar with the little difference. And of course, they don't use all the tonalities. For example, G minor, that is very typical in a partiment. It's very easy to find that G minor partimento on the guitar, it doesn't exist. Really? Okay. Almost doesn't. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, the bemolle is, a, is the greatest enemy of the guitarist. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So when, when we find a G minor partimento... Hey, you know, right? A blues it. guitar... You're, you're a blues guitarist, right? All these sharp keys, A major, E major. A horn player will just say, you know what? I'm out of here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just the way it is, right? Yeah, of course. So, you know, when I started to play Finaroli, I transposed some of his partimentos. Okay, so you do transpose the partimenti to yeah, a yeah, more guitaristic sure. key. Yes, because, uh, you know, the, the guitar... Uh, the, there's such a big difference with keyboard because on keyboard you just play horizontally. So your your hands move on a horizontal line. But on the guitar you move on a horizontal but also vertical line. And then you have some um, some jolly that are the open strings. When you realize a, a partimento, you, you put a bass. This is a G bass. When I hold this with a hand, I cannot go anywhere with my hand, but I can just take the frets that I have near this finger. So while on the on the keyboard you just play a bass with a hand and with the other hand you do whatever you want, realizing on the guitar is like to realize a partimento on the keyboard but with only one hand. So uh, you really need the open strings to move your hand and do some more interesting uh, things. And uh, that's why I, I transpose uh, partimenti normally, because I cannot play a B major partimento with uh, no open strings. It's not only difficult, it just uh, doesn't make sense. What about the, the voice leading? So when we learn the rule of the octave, that kind of solves a lot of the voice leading. So for the guitar, when you're putting in the basic consonances, are you very careful to make sure, because the guitar is... I mean, it's kind of a weird instrument so because there's, and I'm saying that as a guitarist, there's the same note in, in each string. Sometimes you can find the F, right, on yeah, all six strings. Yeah, that's another problem with the guitar. You have too many notes. <laughs> of the same note, right? So how do you prevent bad counterpoint on the guitar? You, you practice a lot uh, two voices, only two voices, because uh, it's very difficult to, um, to control more than three voices on the guitar. So the guitar texture will be uh, a good texture if it is uh, three voices, uh, but many melodies uh, is just bass and, and one melody of one line. So you practice a lot two voices. Now, what about cadences on the guitar? What are some good ways to learn cadences on guitar? And actually, you can tell, what are the good keys on the guitar? Well, the good keys are all the keys uh, for which we have a repertoire. So C major, D major and minor, E major and minor, G major, A major and minor, and that's it. Uh, all the others are like the one percent of the of the guitar uh, practice and repertoire. And uh, well, the the cadenzas are 
I really, I really can find you, to can do you, on can the you guitar. Can you play some cadences for us just to see how it sounds on the guitar? Yeah, it's a. Uh, or you can do. A, it's very easy when you have open strings uh, to do the, the compound uh, cadence. Yeah, cadence is totally fine, and there are a lot uh, into the guitar methods. In the Caruli method, uh, he has a lot of exercise where you have first a cadence in that tonality, and then an exercise. Also, Johan Kaspar Merz did the same thing. Giuliani, no, but Giuliani is very good to study because in his uh, Opus 1, he puts a lot of exercise on uh, intervals, on thirds, sixths, octaves, tenths. So when you have to realize uh, a bass, uh, you really need to, to have these intervals into the into the hand is also a, a mechanical work so you, you you don't really think every note you are playing you just do because you have this into into your hands it goes uh, you know five six are just like uh, positions uh, on the fretboard when we talk about learning figured bass on the guitar, I've read that you've mentioned there's a book by Peter Croton, which I think he has a book on figured bass for the guitar. Yes. Could be a good primer for people. But my question about figured bass on the guitar is, now with the Baroque guitar and the lute, was that chords they were strumming or was it actually like three voice textured harmonies that they were creating? In the Baroque guitar, it's mostly strumming. You, you can do some... Uh, some counterpoint, but it's really, it's really not the main job you're, you're doing. It's most strumming on the, on the baroque guitar. Is that the same for guitar then? When we learn figured bass on the guitar, is that also strumming? No, because the, on the classical guitar, you actually have basses that are missed on the baroque guitar. So the, the bass uh, realization on the classical guitar is, uh, is more similar to the, to the lute. So you, you actually realize a bass with a voice leading. You know, there's some things when people learn the guitar, they learn chords, you know, chord symbols, your C, F, G, and that kind of thing. But one yeah. thing I've noticed is when we do that, sometimes we get a lot of parallel, parallel motion in chords. So if I take an F chord shape, a bar chord, and I just move it up to G in a bar shape, there's, I mean, that's fine in popular music, but I guess you wouldn't really do that, right, in the 18th century, that kind of movement. You know, on the on the baroque guitar, they didn't mean they didn't care about the octaves, because the baroque guitar is really it's almost impossible to have a proper uh, voice leading. So is uh, it that they don't have basses, they have uh, double notes everywhere. So there are several article, articles that studied these uh, realizations. Uh, they really, on the baroque guitar, I say, or not on the lute, but on the baroque guitar, they didn't care so much about uh, fifth and octaves. So like power chords then? <laughs> yes, yes. You know, the, there is an incredible work about uh, by Thomas Christensen that supports the idea that while the, the music was polyphonic, uh, till, uh, let's say, the, the beginning of 17th century, when they introduced the baroque guitar and there was the guitar alphabet, also just chords uh, to be strummed, at that point they invented the, the identity of a chord. They invented the G major chord as an really? independent entity. Yeah, it's, a, it's just a beautiful, beautiful article by Thomas Christensen saying that because of the guitar they invented the what we know as a G major, E minor, etc. Really? Because wow. there was no way to control the voice leading on the guitars. That's like the, the greatest historical thing I've ever heard. <laughs> wow. So we can uh, we can really, I guess you can thank or curse guitar for the chord symbol, right? I guess it kinda <laughs> <laughs> That's really mind blowing. Oh my goodness. It's an incredible story about the the, the bar guitar. While on the um, on the lute uh, is much more similar to the classical guitar, and I found very interesting that uh, there is a method by the lute player uh, Nigel North. He wrote a beautiful book about uh, realizing basso continuo on lute and turbo, and he explains how, as we have the problem of voice leading, uh, it's very important to to learn some uh, some shapes that we know don't contain uh, mistakes. So he said, just uh, when you have uh, like a five-six chord chord, you, you, you have not so much the time on, the, on an instrument like the lute and the guitar is the same 
to think about the proper voice leading because every time is different. Uh, as I said, we are, because we don't work only on uh, one uh, um, line, horizontal line, like the keyboard, uh, but we work on two lines plus the, the jolly of uh, open strings. So we we have too much, too many options to choose. So we we cannot choose any. We just do pa pa, and and we know that there are, there are not mistakes in this uh, in these shapes on the guitar. Can I ask then culturally, because you know the, they're so obsessed about counterpoint in the 18th, 17th, 16th century. So they just, I mean, is it like today they give guitarists a lot of like leeway? Like, just do your thing, you know. Don't worry, but just play the. Give we know we want the guitar sound in the ensemble, and that's it. But no, for example, Sora is exactly the um, the example of incredible counterpoint uh, writing and uh, voice leading on the guitar. Okay, talk about him. I think that Sora cannot be compared to the other guitarist because he was a, a really um, he was trained in the monastery of Montserrat that is a, is a, out of Barcelona and uh, they had really a severe program about harmony and counterpoint and uh, Fernando Sora brought uh, all these uh, all these notions of harmony and counterpoint on the guitar. That's why his music uh, at the level of counterpoint is much more rich and complex than any other of his uh, colleagues. And by any other, who do you mean? I mean Giuliani, Carulli, Carcassi, Merz. Uh, there, I think there's no one other guitarist that can be compared uh, with Sora thinking about counterpoint and harmony. He really did uh, incredible, uh, incredible, uh, yeah. Let's say he had incredible results in counterpoint on the guitar. That's why his music is much more complicated to to study and to and to learn. Very interesting. And did Soar have? I mean, obviously, he has a lot of compositions. Does he have a method book that he's ever published? Yes, it's a it's a beautiful book, uh, the method of Soar, because he explains much more things than uh, if you think the method of Giuliani is just music. There are arpeggios, uh, intervals, uh, some pieces about ornamentations, uh, while the method of Soros talks about uh, strings, uh, where do you have to buy a guitar, how you transcribe. Uh, there are some examples. He made the transcriptions of Haydn, and he shows how to reduce music on the guitar with a proper voice leading. He talks about the, the colors of guitar, how to imitate other instruments. Yeah, the, the method of Soros is an incredible book. So if we go back to Pardimento, now the book one of Fenderoli is your standard book on consonances. What about dissonances now? So if we're talking about dissonances, I mean, on the keyboard, it's quite, like you said, horizontal. Is it tricky to be able to hold notes because you, you have limited strings and you have to prepare dissonances? How does that work on the guitar? So there are some uh, dissonances that are very easy going on the guitar, like 4-3. But also the chain of uh, seven six seven six. So etc. When we have like the nine, uh, is not always uh, easy to do it on the on the guitar. In some keys are um, we are able to do it uh, naturally, but in some others it's very difficult to to find a fingering uh, that can hold you the note. Uh, and then resolve on the consonants. So what about what the other things in Partimento? Can we talk about bass motions now? Yes, also the bass motions are really... Um, there are many special cases on the guitar. Like for the rule of the octave, uh, we often change the octave of the bass. So when we have a bass that goes up by step, Often we change the octave, so it's not anymore uh, up by step, but uh, there are some uh, some jumps. Also, many times when we have, for example, uh, jump down a third up a second, so we have... Uh, this can be fine in C major, but if we change the, the key, we have to adjust the bass, so... The, the intervals are not always the same. What we can uh, do about uh, bass motions uh, is 
is just learning like a, a finger pattern and it helps a lot to to resolve these uh, passages i uh, like i said before uh, if we we do 5 6 in the style of giuliani it's very easy to do it because you just move the the left hand well if you do it uh, with no hand shape uh, is much much more difficult i would say that guitar is um, almost has no rules but has a lot of special cases would you be able to demonstrate a few more moti del basso because i think they're very beautiful when i hear them on the guitar yes i, I like a lot I, I think you read the, the book of um, joe bilzerman uh, harmony contrapoint departimento and uh, he makes some exercises uh, on uh, on Moti del Basso in the first two chapters, and are the same, of course, that we can find in the in the Partimenti. We can do, yeah, this I like is a uh, third down step up. Mm. Or you can do. There are several uh, different realization of uh, of this one. Up a fourth, down a fifth. Yes. Or you can do. Uh, making suspension. And this uh, is not very easy because you cannot keep all the notes. Huh? So it sounds better one octave down. Why is the guitar notated in treble clef? Because, I mean, it, I know that even though it's notated in treble clef, the actual pitch is an octave down, right? And actually, I was so shocked to hear this, but the range of the guitar is really, it's like its like the E below the bass clef. Yeah, I think because uh, the guitar, it goes also a lot higher. So uh, it's better to don't have too many Ledger additional, uh, yes. Right. But that means like you could really, if if you read it, if you played guitar in the bass clef and, and actually notated it in the bass clef, you could read all these partimenti, right? They would sound at the exact concert pitch. Exactly. But normally to practice, I I transpose them in a treble clef. Because if I want to write down something, I, I want to be as fast as possible. Okay. So what are some manuscripts or treatises that people should check out that would be relevant for partimento playing on the guitar? Oh, and you can mention like the opus number and that sort of thing. For the guitar, I would suggest the opus one uh, by Mauro Giuliani with all the work on the intervals. That's very, very important. And uh, um, his opus 50 and 51 uh, as uh, studies because they are pretty different from the other collection of studies. These are more contrapuntal. contrapuntal. Uh, at the same time, I suggest the Lavinia manuscript because it has a lot of uh, counterpoint examples uh, really similar to the one of Giuliani. And, and would you say uh, keep it keep it to two voices then? Yes, totally. Okay. You keep it to two voices, uh, maximum three, but only if you are going like, uh, you know, parallel thirds and the other voice is moving. This is, is easy to manage on the guitar. If you want three voices just moving uh, differently, is uh, I think it's too hard. Then I would say the, the method of uh, Ferdinando Carulli. He, and he wrote a guitar method that is very useful because it goes uh, for every key with uh, cadenzas and exercises in every key. And you, so you've looked at those. So you mentioned you just said every key. And so what about those weird keys like B and... No, 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 no. I, I mean, uh, he, he wrote for guitar keys. Oh, okay. <laughs> so every... I mean, yeah, All yeah. the guitar keys. Okay, I get it. Exactly. And uh, he wrote also a book of uh, harmony for the guitar. That's very interesting. Uh, where he explains how to, to make an accompaniment. The guitarist uh, always thought about uh, accompany. So like if you want to make a basso continuo, 
not really partimento. But uh, if you want to make harmony on the guitar, uh, Ferdinando Carulli wrote uh, a really good book about this. And then I would suggest also by Fernando Sor, Opus uh, 31 and 35, that are two collections of uh, easy studies that are also almost always uh, like uh, in a two voice uh, setting and are, um, are really useful to see some examples about how to move uh, how to move the voices on the guitar now you're a professional classical guitarist is it heresy to try these things on the acoustic guitar and you can be honest actually i, I never owned uh, an acoustic guitar and uh, <laughs> <laughs> you never I played no blues idea. guitar on the acoustic no only the electric the electric guitar, guitar. <laughs> yes with uh, with plectro you know, when I was taking guitar lessons, the classical guitar teachers were so strict. Your hand has to be like this. You have to hold the guitar like this. No, I think when you when you learn this thing on a guitar, you learn a style. So if you if you're okay about uh, playing uh, gallant style on electric guitar, it's totally okay for me. It's a uh, it's just a matter of style, not of uh, instrument. Now. Talking specifically about partimento, not basso continuo, realizing partimento, can this be done on the fly or is this more for coming up with a realization and then recording it and then that's it, moving on to the next partimento? Or can you actually improvise on the guitar in partimento? Not everything. I think on the guitar, uh, it's, it's totally fine to just do like easy things, uh like the first book of uh, Finaroli with uh, no dissonance, just putting the, the rule of the octave uh, and some cadenzas, uh, this you can do. But if you want to write uh, a proper voice leading, if you want to do a proper voice leading, uh, it's very difficult. Also because uh, in many partimenti, uh, the bass, it moves really a lot. Well, if you, go, if you look at the guitar repertoire of that time, uh, the basses, uh, uh, they move uh, much, much less. It's very difficult to, to make a proper voice leading when you have only one hand that have to care about all the, all the notes, bass and, uh, and trebles. So when I, when I want to realize a partimento, let's say in a, um, in a more appropriate way that uh, sounds good on the guitar, I, I try some many solutions at home, improvising, but then I need to, to write down to have a, a real realization, a good realization. What about free composition or free improvisation on the guitar? Because these moti del basso and the schema and all these contrapuntal ideas, these cadences, the rule of the octave, they're really beautiful things. And do you find that you can write little pieces with this a lot easier? And you see from the repertoire that how they did it and you can come up with your own compositions as well i think they are yeah as you say they are really useful to to write down uh, some some your of your pieces like uh, little preludes little studs to a free improvisation i think uh, is uh, is much easier to um, to think about schemas because they are um, when you use a schema you have like a wider look at the at the phrase at the structure of the piece so it's it's easier to to do something instrumental and effective more than when you realize just a moto del basso and you are really concentrated on that kind of rule. Let's say in the schema you are more free. If now you know if I could go back in time because I was nine years old when I took classical guitar lessons and it was pretty standard. If you could be my teacher and I would say. Please teach me more in the figured bass way. Teach me more in the partimento way. What? How would you teach a young kid? So I would start with uh, scales and intervals. And to play and play and play so many times that your fingers get used and know uh, where to go at the moment on the fretboard. After that, uh, I will do rule of the octave. And then uh, I... I made like a collection of uh, little models to to exercise on counterpoint, and I think it's a good way to have, um, I say, to to get fluent uh, in uh, in doing these kind of things. And uh, while doing this thing, I think it's a good option the um, 
the approach of uh, job yields and run that make uh, put together a counterpoint and partimento with schemas because you cannot learn first all the counterpoint and then all uh, and then go to make a schema you just learn this kind of things uh, together so i will make counterpoint and then putting into a schema and then try to uh, ornate this kind of uh, of schema to have something more uh, musical let me ask some technical things about figured bass on the guitar for instance, six four two chords, six five chords, six four three chords. Do you find that that's easy to do on the guitar? Because you know, guitarists we like to think of chord symbols, right? And it's just so straightforward. Oh, this this chord, that chord. But what about reading chords on the guitar in terms of figures? As um, as I said before, it's very useful the the approach of Nigel North. Uh, that is the same for the root and the guitar. For example, the six four two chord. Or the three, four, six. Uh, you know, you have uh, a lot of music in uh, in C major on the guitar when you just play, and this is very easy to do it on the guitar, the three, four, six chord. But in this uh, key, if you want to do on another key, this is a uh, is much much more difficult. Some chords are very easy in one key and very difficult uh, in the next key. So you you usually learn the the good ones on the guitar. What if I wanted to improvise not on a partimento bass, but just on a simple? Imagine it's just whole notes or half notes, and it's not so crazy the bass line, and I need to improvise something like a partimento on top of those bass notes. Would that be something I can do on the guitar? Yes, totally. That's uh, that's something you can really do it. Uh, taking uh, as an example the studies of uh, of these guitarists, where the uh, often the for example there is Basso Albertino. On this kind of uh, of bass that is really steady and uh, moves that sounds every, great. every part. <laughs> That's like fantastic. It, it's, it's, it's very easy to do, so you can do something That's like, like cheating. Uh, You're of, making uh, that very, up, right? Very... I mean, you're, you're kind of making... I just played the, the, <laughs> the easiest thing uh, that came to my mind. That sounded incredible. And that's using models and the training that we can gather from Partimento, Counterpoint, Figured Bass, that sort of thing? No, in, with this training, you can do much better things. Uh, for example, if you want to use some uh, easy, some common schematas, you can do many pieces on the guitar, starts with Do, Re, Mi, with, so something like... Uh, and then you go with a printer and then you want a cadenza or you want to go with a with a monte so you make something then you can go on with a with a font so something like uh, And then you you go back to your do re mi or you put a major or something like uh... well we hope that uh, many guitarists will uh, will get interested into this topic and develop uh, new new guitar books uh, a new way to to teach the guitar in a more uh, fun and interesting uh, way if i have just a simple bass progression how many ways can I color that progression? What, what are the different variations? So can you show me three different ways to do a simple progression? Yes. If we want to do something like, let's say we want to do one, two, three, four, five, and, uh, and one. We can realize this uh, like in the style of a, of a prelude, so with several uh, different formulas of arpeggio, like... A, Or 
you can have um, another kind of arpeggio. Or you want a more uh, two voice uh, set, so something like. Or you want like a call and response, so something like. Can I ask you a question about diminution then? So we talked about the bass notes and the harmony going from chord to chord. What is your recommendation for developing that vocabulary of diminution from chord to chord? Uh, with my students, I use the, the very easy studies by Fernando Sor that are studies um, is opor, opus 31 and 35, uh, these are very easy and so are very good to develop um, diminutions. For example, you have a You can use this simple um, study to make some diminution, like uh, something like this. So you you add uh, passing notes, or you can start also with uh, How many some, voices uh, was that? Was that three voices? It's uh, two, two, two voices. That sounded so some, uh, full. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Uh, you, you just make it full when, when you don't have to make uh, <laughs> other things with, uh, with your fingers. Guitars should just be two voices. So good. I, you know, uh, when, when we think about guitar, we always think that guitar is an instrument that can make everything. But often uh, it makes more with uh, with less. Yeah. Most of the most beautiful guitar pieces are just you know arpeggios. Is uh, many guitar music is just uh, bass and one voice that moves, or one arpeggio on a steady chord. So you don't actually do so many things with three, four voices. Oh so my goodness! The partimento, almost... the partimento is bang, bang, bang. Is bass note, bass note, bass note. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a partimento is really challenging yeah. on the guitar because you have to make so, so many things. It's boom, Sometimes boom. When I want yeah, to, yeah, it's. But yeah, you know, you just playing that is is such a profound thing. What you just said, and it is so clear when you play it. It sounds so beautiful, and when we slow it down and we think less is more. And, and you know, uh, maybe I think uh, uh, a good realization on Partimenti comes with uh, you know the schema that is uh, interesting, boring. And we know I read on the book on, of Sanguinetti that normally it's just a double counterpoint. So when you have the bass that moves, the other voices are steady. So the boring, interesting uh, game when you have a Partimento that makes. Uh, You normally realize with the upper voices that do only long notes. And then it change is exactly the opposite. So you have long notes at the bass. And you go with upper voices. And if you put together, it sounds quite well on the guitar and is not like the most difficult thing to do. Fantastic. This is a kind of realization that sounds good on the guitar because you do only one thing at a time, not so, not so many. Can I ask you what has been the reaction to your classical guitar colleagues about you playing Partimento on the guitar? It was a, a good uh, a good reaction, like, uh, oh, wow, it's, uh, it's so cool how you do it. It's beautiful. But... Uh, 
nobody joins the game. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Yes. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope so because I, I'm starting to give some. Um, uh, it's a couple of years that I I go to like Congress to to explain uh, what I think about guitar impartimento, and uh, I I found some uh, some colleagues uh, that uh, were also working uh, like me on these topics. So I know that we are uh, we are still a few guitar player, but uh, they they will come more and more. And uh, next year I'm gonna make a a course, a masterclass uh, in the Conservatory of Foggia about this with many guitar students. So um, I I think uh, I think uh, year by year uh, the thing will uh, will grow up. Now you said you discovered Partimento 2005 2006. How do you feel the last two years? Did you notice that there was a big jump in interest? Yes, such a big jump. And uh, um, like every community that goes, um, uh, that uh, expands, uh, of course, uh, also many, many amateurs uh, are joining. So I remember when just op- was opened uh, the Facebook group, the Art of Partimento, there were only PhD students and university professors. Now there are many, many people that are just starting. So uh, we are going maybe a bit less technical, but if, I think it's such a good thing for, uh, for everybody to have uh, a community that is growing and uh, is uh, developing so, so fast. The, the last two years were incredible. And I think uh, the, it will go like this uh, for, uh, for a long time. Now, this is not related to Europe, but I've always, always admired South American classical guitar. I always admired it. And I don't know if you have any experience or in that area, but they just make really good music. And But do you have any experience in South American classical guitar? It sounds very beautiful. I, it's incredible. I, I love South American <laughs> guitar playing. Uh, I am totally in love with Agustin Barrios. That was from... Uh, from uh, from Paraguay, and they um, they they developed uh, a different way to to play the guitar, a different way to put the hands on the guitar. Like, uh, can you demonstrate? Uh, maybe because playing, yeah, yeah, sure. Maybe because coming from a less uh, academic world, they um, what amazed me is like uh, you know the studies of uh, Villa Lobos. Uh, Villa Lobos found a way to make the guitar sound just like a guitar when you play his, um, his music. You know the second prelude. Etc. as the second uh, part that made. These are just like power charts moving on the guitar and making an effect that uh, it can live only on the fretboard of a, of a guitar. For some reason, it sounds okay on the guitar at all the parallelism. Yeah, it sounds okay on the guitar and totally not okay on uh, other instruments. <laughs> uh, and that's why I say that they invented a way to to play the guitar just like a guitar. Because if you think on the classical period, they were always trying to play the guitar like other instruments. The method of Sor is full of, uh, if you want to imitate the cello, do like this. If you want to imitate <laughs> the flute, you should play like this. If you want to be an oboe, play like this. But he never says how to play the guitar as a guitar. <laughs> and this came uh, very, <laughs> very later with uh, South American uh, guitarists. That's why I, I love them. Now, how do you analyze guitar literature? Because now you have Partimento lens, a figured bass lens. Do you see, like, like for instance, can you break down all this literature quite easily now? Like, so if you take a sonatina or the pieces that you normally play, are you seeing stuff that, like, with a composer's insight? Yes, a lot. I think the... The Galant schemata of Gerdingen are a great way to analyze this, this kind of music. I I was used to to analyze the music uh, like with the number of numerals and functions, 
And uh, I was, I remember I was always confused about many things. But when I read the uh, music, music in Gun style, many, many things just became clear about uh, about what's going on into the piece. Why is the why this uh, this section is like this? And imagine, for example, something like uh, quiescenza, no? When you want to analyze this uh, with Roman numerals. Uh, is much harder than to just look at, uh, at this uh, as a schema and uh, as an um, an effect, let's say, uh, into a musical uh, in a, into a musical story. So when I, I came up with the uh, music in Gallant style, uh, yeah, the analysis of this kind of repertoire became much much more clear and easy. Do you write figures or Arabic numerals with circles to denote bass notes when you analyze guitar pieces? Uh, no, usually I just uh, I just uh, write uh, I don't know like uh, with colors. This is a fonte. This is a mayor. This is a do re mi. Nicola, did we leave anything important out with regard to the topic of Parlamento and the guitar? I think there's something important to to say about this that uh, uh, Parlamenti were. Uh, let's say, uh, an activity, uh, a program that you studied when, when you were uh, uh, quite young. So like a 10 years old, a 12 years old could uh, practice partimenti on the keyboard. Coming to the guitar, I see, is, uh, is much more difficult to, to make a study to a, a very young kid, 10, 12 years old, this year, I'm starting with the first uh, experiments with uh, really young kids, and it's, uh, it's very difficult because we um, on the guitar is much harder, like a physic on putting uh, all the fingers uh, on the fretboard, and so is uh, is not only the the mental uh, work that you have to do, but also the the physical. Uh, work on the on the instrument is very hard for a little kid so um, I don't know how it will go with the uh, young kids I know they are uh, uh, very creative and uh, it's very important to study these things before you you get uh, educated with the Roman numerals and other kind of uh, of point of views because uh, when you are an adult it's very difficult to say, okay, now I forget the last five years of harmony and I start from zero with Partimenti. For a kid, it's much easier to, to be natural in these kind of things. But on the guitar, is there's a kind of physical approach that is, is much harder to do. So I think we, with time and many, many experiments on the students, we have to find a way to, to make it on young kids. We left out Giuliani's student. Felix Horetsky, who's a Polish musician, does he have any materials that might be useful for Partimento guitarists? Yes, I remember Horetsky wrote, I think it's a method, uh, it's full of exercises uh, like uh, of counterpoint uh, in scale uh, and there are arpeggios and cadenzas. Yes, I, I read this material, I didn't find uh, particularly useful the Horetsky material. I prefer to to just read the, um, the studies of Giuliani. Okay. I'm so obsessed now with historically informed performance. And so for the guitar, can you help me in that regard? Who are some good performers, interpreters of 18th century and 18th century music on the guitar? Are there any recordings of people you admire that maybe you can share with my audience? Yes. I, I really like the recordings of Maccari and Pugliese. They they are they have a fantastic guitar duo. They play a lot uh, in duo, but also alone. Claudio Maccari and Paolo Pugliese, and they recorded uh, uh, all duos by Sor, by Giuliani. Then they made also a, pro, um, a project about Beethoven sonatas on the guitars. They sound amazing, uh, but especially they they play mostly the original uh, 19th century guitar. And they uh, specialized for many years uh, on the on this kind of repertoire. So I, I really like how they 
how they play this uh, this music. And then there is uh, I like a lot uh, Carlo Marchione. He plays Giuliani, fantastic, and uh, but on the classical uh, modern guitar. And another player that I really admire, and uh, he's studying also early music, so I I think he will do even more beautiful things uh, in the future is uh, Lorenzo Micheli, that is a, an Italian guitar player, is um, an incredible guitar player and also a really, really good teacher. And uh, yeah, by, by Lorenzo, he, he recorded the, the, the Rossignanas and he plays a lot live, this kind of uh, repertoire. So I, I totally suggest uh, to, to listen to him when, uh, when there is uh, the occasion to do it. Do you want to comment on, I think Julian Bream passed away quite recently, right? And he was a very famous classical guitarist. Did you have any, did you listen to his recordings much? Yes, Julian Bream was like my, really my my hero because he he played with such a, a creativity, a fantasy. He was so original in, uh, in playing a repertoire that many other players played, uh, let's say, in a way much more uh, academic while Brim always put all his uh, fantasy and all his feelings into music. He did an incredible uh, work for both guitar and the lute. That's why also the lute community is, uh, is crying uh, for his departure. And he uh, did uh, also a lot of job with the contemporary composers. Uh, so composers like William Walton, Benjamin Britten, they, also, they all wrote uh, for guitar incredible music just because of him. And so I think, yeah, Julian Brim is really the, um, the example of every modern uh, guitar player about having a, a full musical life, full of uh, creativity and, um, and, uh, and fantasy in, uh, in making music. And could you comment on flamenco players who play in a completely different style, so, so to speak, but it's quite interesting. They use this the same kind of classical guitar. Do you have any experience with that style, flamenco? Uh, the classical repertoire is full of flamenco-like uh, style. Of course, uh, it's not exactly the same because uh, a flamenco player studies a lot the, the rhythms of the classical flamenco dances because the, the flamenco guitar is born to accompany dance and then singing. Then much more uh, after it became a, a solo instrument. And uh, what I like in uh, flamenco players is that they learn a lot of schemas. So I think for a flamenco player it would be very easy to to deep dive into this kind of uh, of world that we we love about uh, improvisation and partimenti because they it's what they do every day. They improvise on. Uh, on coplas, uh, they have uh, a lot of um, of schemas, uh, and they they really know how to do it on the guitar. So maybe they are the uh, they will be the best in doing these kind of things. My final question is about chord symbols, and that's that's quite different from partimento and figured bass. And it's been a pretty normal way to teach guitar for the last century, or just chord symbols. But from what you've told me. Even earlier, right, a G major chord came originally, uh, what's that, in the 17th century or something? Something very early. Now, what's your opinion about that pedagogy-wise? Because if somebody learns to read chord symbols, there's really no thought, I think, in the voice leading of chord symbols. I mean, unless you get to a very high level. But when people are learning chords, they just go, oh, this is A minor, this is G, this is D, and so forth. They just hit the shapes, right? Um, so now with your knowledge of Partimento and Cardam Point and the voice leading, does that have any effect on the way we teach chord symbols? Yes. I'm happy you, you made me this, uh, this question. I didn't expect, <laughs> but uh, I, I really want to, to answer this because it's a, it's a topic that uh, I, I think a lot. Uh, when the, it came out, the first guitar alfabeto in the 17th century, at the beginning, uh, if you ever had the occasion to use this kind of alphabet, it's very different from the modern one that we use. Now we have A, B, C, D is A, B, C, and D. So La, Si, Do, Re, Mi, etc. While in the Baroque era, the, the order was really uncommon because the A was a G major, the B was a C major, 
the C was a D major, D is A minor, so there, there is not a clear order in the um, in in all the chords uh, in the in the order of the chords, and uh, I found out uh, I found out uh, the order like three three years ago. I was really reading a book about uh, the art of memory. There's a, a terrific book by Frances Yates that is, she's an expert uh, about memory in the medieval times and Renaissance time. And uh, uh, suddenly I found on this book alphabeto chart. Alphabeto chart was a chart of alphabeto and uh, every letter was meant to have the shape of an object. So for example, you have scissors. If you have scissors, they look like an X, like the shape of the object. And uh, at the time I was studying baroque guitar and I was wondering about why A is a G major while B is a C major, etc. Uh, I just didn't understand, didn't find a way to memorize these chart shapes. And uh, comparing with this book about memory, I found out that in the Baroque era, they just had the letter that had the shape of your fingers on the guitar when you play a chart. So if you play a G major chord on the Baroque guitar, you just open your fingers like an A, like a letter A. And if you play, uh, if you play B major, your uh, sorry C major, your uh, the shapes of your fingers just look like a B. So that was super clear. And I found out that uh, when you teach, when you teach guitar and you teach chords, uh, is a very good way to teach uh, looking at the shapes of the fingers on the fretboard. So I think when you when you want to teach harmony and the basso continuo or some uh, easy realization of partimento, it's very important to have this approach that is super practical. There's nothing theory here. It's super practical on your instrument to memorize some shapes of the fingers on the guitar. And I think it's, um, it's much easier and much useful than to use the modern uh, guitar alphabeto that we all use if we want to play some songs, you know, for friends like uh, Yesterday of the Beatles. When you when you read uh, the modern alphabeto and uh, it doesn't have any connection on the with the fingers with the shape of your fingers on the instrument, well the baroque alphabeto was totally this was just uh, how you shape your fingers on the fretboard. So that's amazing. In fact, that's so similar to like for instance in jazz when when they are breaking down a solo by somebody like Charlie Christian, they say a lot of the notes are coming out of the shape of the chords, like Joe Pass and that sort of thing. So that's kind of mind-blowing, actually. It's another thing that is pretty crazy. So, wow. Uh, yes, I I love this topic, and I, I wrote an article that uh, was published two years ago at the university because it's, um, it's an incredible topic because it's, um, it uh, connects the guitar with uh, the art of memory that is connected also to many other actors in the Renaissance time. And it was super useful for uh, guitarists. It, it meant a lot for uh, our instruments uh, at the time. So it's very strange to uh, to have it today totally changed. Can I say something yes, funny? Yes, of course. Uh, when, uh, when I was searching about this, the first book ever claiming to have invented the, the guitar alfabeto was... Uh, by Gerolamo Montesardo was published uh, in Rome in uh, 16 and 6. And uh, is exactly as the same, exactly the same front page of Guitar for Dummies <laughs> is written. Really, is, you can compare it. Uh, I'll send you the photos. It's written uh, a super easy method that you can learn by yourself with no teacher. <laughs> It was exactly the same in 16.6 and now in the in 21st oh century. Oh my gosh. It was just guitar for that. That is so funny. That is the funniest thing. You know, that, isn't that so interesting that some things never really change, right? Yes. Yes, yes. When, when you want to sell a guitar book, the easiest way is just <laughs> go, go, go to the amateur. Yeah. <laughs> and I found uh, an article uh, that was comparing the, the music prints uh, before and after that date, and the printing went like skyrocketing. <laughs> Wouldn't it be crazy if he outsold Fresco Baldi, right? Wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Fresco Baldi at some point, but also Monteverdi, had to write some uh, 
alphabeto songs, they called it, <laughs> because they were selling so well that even if they didn't like the style, they, they had to print something just to make money. <laughs> Isn't that so funny? I mean, that some things really never change, and that's that's really hilarious. Yeah, it's super, <laughs> super funny. Well what, <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I say? A big thank you to Nicola Pignatello for coming onto the show to talk about Partimento on the guitar and so many other topics. It's been definitely a much-requested topic because we have so many guitarists listening, and I'm glad that I was able to have this conversation with you. Now, if people want to get in touch with you, how do they do that? And please, what do you have in store for the rest of the year? Thank you. Thank you so much. If uh, people want to, to be in contact with me, they, they can contact me on the Instagram page, uh, Nicola Pignatiello, or I have a Facebook page of the Duo Scarlatti. And, uh, and yes, or by email or whatever. I, I really like to to contact uh, to to get in contact with the community because we have to to do this all together. And uh, uh, for the rest of the year, I am I'm just finishing a, a guitar edition of the Fenarori Rules because I think we we need something where to start. And I think the rules of Fenaroli with the Moti del Basso and all the examples took from the the manuscripts are. Um, can be very well translated. I transcribed for guitar, I changed some keys, but uh, can be a, a first textbook to, to start realizing at first, uh, at, at least the, the first books of, uh, of Fenaroli and to start with, uh, with something because we really lack of um, material. Then uh, we are all in, uh, in stop with concerts, so we are making more, mostly recordings so we are studying with uh, Duo Scarlatti some new pieces for two guitar. I'm making recordings uh, for uh, Tiorbo with a with a singer with music of Caccini Monteverdi, and with the Mishmash we have a group of um, world music. We are preparing um, a special program uh, about uh, Bella Bartok and his field recordings uh, in the um, in the countryside of uh, of Hungary and uh, Turkey. So these are the, um, the the projects for the rest of the year. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Nicola, for being on the Nikhil Hogan Show. I really hope to be able to talk to you again soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Nikhil.